The other day, someone on Twitter uh, made a snarky comment that I was late to the party on, uh, I think it was my Godzilla review. But of course, I, that, I'd that i seen that the weekend it came out. So my late to the party was like, Monday? <laughs> Which isn't that late. Like, it's not that late to, to make a review. But I am often late to the party. Uh, there's this rat race in media, in YouTubing, in in journalism. It's this it's this hurry to get to the thing, to talk about the thing in time, at the beginning, when there's when it's hot. Strike while the iron is hot. And some stuff, honestly, I just I'm not I, I don't care to get it out that fast, right? So so I'm talking about the fall of the House of Usher today, uh, which came out a few weeks ago. It's the new Mike Flanagan show. Uh, he's done stuff like The Haunting of Hill House, Midnight Mass, so forth. He has a specific style and very specific casting. A lot of the same people are in all of his shows, and there, there will be you know rotating uh, actors who aren't in all of them, but they're in some of them. And, and, and so it's, it, you see familiar faces from one show to the next, which is certainly the case here with uh, House of Usher. This show was is sort of based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, so it's, you know, Poe, of course, being one of the most famous horror writers of all time, uh, famous for things like The Pit and the Pendulum, uh, The Cask of Amontillado, The Monkey's Paw, uh, The Telltale Heart, and so on and so forth. The Raven, the poem The Raven. What Flanagan has done with this show is he's, he's created a very wealthy family, similar to the family on Succession, though much more one-dimensional. Uh, he's created this wealthy family with this mystery around the family. We know in the very first episode that all of this rich dude's kids, the, the sort of the, the old uh, Roderick Usher, the, the head of this dynasty, right? All of his kids have died. We find that out right away. And then the, the rest of... The season, we, f- we, fig- we see how they die, and eventually, eventually we learn why they die. And some of the deaths are super gruesome, some of them are a little repetitive, uh, and they're all somewhat supernatural. This, this is definitely a supernatural show filled with allegory, uh, the allegory being, on one level, sort of how vast amounts of wealth do not make you happy, they don't make you rich in the ways that matter, but also in, I think it's very allegorical for like generational uh, disdain. So this, this, the older generation doesn't think about the future of the, of the coming generation and leaves them to get screwed in the end. So it's definitely like a, a criticism of, you know, the, the baby boomers and this generation that's come before that's left the earth, you know, you know, society, civilization, and the, the natural world, the planet, facing climate change and all these other things. So it's very allegorical. Flanagan has a style that I find a little off-putting. Uh, I, I liked Midnight Mass more than this show, uh, and it's the most recent one I've watched, so that's that's where I'm going to sort of do my comparison, I guess. Uh, Midnight Mass, I thought, was creepier... It had that cool vampire vibe going, uh, mixed with, you know, it's it's sort of, I want to say it's sort of flimsy, superficial critique of religion. But it worked in in its, in you know, in it, it was pretty scary, I guess. The um, House of Usher, well, I'm just going to shorten the fall of the House of Usher to the House of Usher, uh, was less scary to me, though it had some pretty crazy... It had at least one really crazy death scene. Um, I think that the biggest problem I had with this show is that it, you you can't help but think about Edgar Allan Poe as you watch it. If you know, I'm not like some Poe aficionado. Uh, it's honestly, it's been years since I've read most of the of his stuff. Uh, but but he's a great you know he's a classic. He's, his, his works are classics. He's a great writer. Uh, he wrote un- very unique stuff for his time, especially. And those stories stick with you, you know. Uh, they stick with you. So when you're watching the show, if you've read his work, if you're, when you're watching the show, you're like, oh, yeah, 
that's, you know, that's the telltale tell heart. Um, but while you're watching, you sort of can't help but compare, like, what this show is trying to do to what Poe is trying to do. Uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it feels a little forced. Uh, and sometimes just the, the overall, the writing, the, um, the production, everything feels a little cheap to me, I guess. Like it's trying to be serious TV, but it's never quite actually serious TV, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure the best way to actually phrase that because it's sort of hard to put a pin on it. Uh, like, the acting's fine. The writing, for the most part, is fine. It all works, but I'm never sitting there watching thinking, wow, that was really deep, or, oh, man, that really took me by surprise. Like, the characters all feel... For, for one thing, there's pretty much only two characters, maybe three, in the whole show that you actually care about. Most of the characters are just awful. And now, I know, in Succession, most of the characters were awful also. But, because Sex Succession was such a deep character study, four seasons of getting to know these characters and what makes them tick and how they interact with each other and why they're awful. And you sort of find yourself caring about them to some degree <laughs> and laughing at them to some degree. I just got... <laughs> I just got the line, I'm the eldest boy, uh, in my head as I was talking. And that is so, so funny. Um, that show, you know, Succession is so surprising all the time. And it has such phenomenal dialogue. And such great unexpected, I, wanna, I don't even want to call them twists. But you just, you don't really know what's coming in that show a lot of the time. Because it, feel, it feels very much like, it feels very real. Uh, whereas, you know, it's not dealing in, in supernatural. I love supernatural stuff, but there's something about like this deep dive into these wealthy, wealthy uh, people and their hollow, hollow lives and their petty, petty feuds, uh, that makes succession really click for me. Whereas House of Usher just feels like so surface level the whole time. And even kind of, you know, you, of all the characters, you get to know Roderick Usher the most, but you kind of you kind of wonder what the point is. I don't know. I did. It just felt like it felt like a they were they okay. This is what it was. They 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 were they were trying to tell this story and use the characters to tell the story. Whereas in Succession, they're they're doing a character. They're doing the characters first. The characters drive the story. You follow those characters through this story. Whereas in House of Usher, the characters are just there for the story right? They're just there to fill in the blanks, to, to make all those pieces, all the little Edgar Allan Poe re references and Easter eggs, all the little, you know, all that work towards the inevitable conclusion. It doesn't matter who the characters are. Honestly, half the time, it doesn't matter how they die. It could have been, you know, like one character um, smashes a bunch of mirrors and ends up, like, killing herself with glass. Uh, Another, like, chases a cat around the house, this, like, devil cat, and he, like, smashes up all the walls, and eventually, you know, that leads to his death. These are very similar kind of deaths, honestly, and they could theoretically have been swapped. I mean, they weren't that unique. There were a couple of unique deaths. The club scene death was crazy. I will not deny that that was one of the craziest death scenes I've ever seen in any show, and kudos to them for coming up with that, even though it was really obvious that it was going to happen uh, the moment they set up the sprinkler system in the old, abandoned, chemical warehouse. Anyways, uh, the, the fall of the House of Usher uh, is also, it also is just, I don't know, I want to I say it's too on the nose. Uh, I've seen people critique it because it's woke, because there's like, gay characters and, and multiracial cast, I think that's a really stupid and bigoted uh, take. For one thing, a lot of the uh, LGBTQ characters in this show are awful people. <laughs> they are just as awful as the straight white men. They are despicable in their own way. Uh, pretty much everybody's pretty despicable in this. Uh, again, there's only two or three characters who are likable. Uh, one of them is a white guy, one of them is a black guy, and one of them is a teenage girl. 
Uh, so beyond that, I don't know. Well, okay, maybe a couple others, but they have such small parts. Who cares? Um, everyone else is pretty despicable. I did like um, Mark Hamill's character, Arthur Pym, the 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 uh, lawyer for the for the Usher family, but. He gets one of the worst lines in the whole show, and this is where it starts. These are the sort of the on the nose parts where we're dealing with this very wealthy, very horrible family that runs a prescription drug company that's responsible for countless deaths. Apparently, we learn millions of deaths. Uh, but there's a a reference to Trump and this this lawyer for this family kind of talks about how even he draws a line somewhere. Is this dig on Trump? But it's like. These people are like Trump times a hundred. They're like, they're they're richer and they've caused more death and destruction and they're more evil than most billionaires. I mean, they're really really bad. So just just to have that little Trump dig felt. First of all, it felt unearned. Second of all, it sort of takes you out of the the fiction and puts you in the real world. And it's this reference to something that like in ten years maybe no one even remembers. Uh, and it's just not that kind of show. Like. The boys can get away with that kind of thing by by sort of having Homelander do the, you know, kill somebody on the street and get away with it, which is what the reference was about to Trump. Um, they can do that because it's a very heavily, you know, very, uh, it's a political satire that, that does deal with like real world parodies. Whereas this, even though it's kind of a, obviously it's dealing with real world stuff, like the crimes of the pharmaceutical industry and whatnot. It sort of, for the most part, exists in its own, little bubble you know it's it's it it's not that kind of satire so i felt like that really threw me out of the moment um there's a scene where they're showing this character who's kind of a mysterious character in all these photographs with different like rich people throughout the years and that was more i mean that wasn't subtle but at least it wasn't like at least it wasn't just just a dig on a political figure in you know 2023 it was you know Lots of different people throughout the years, rich people throughout the years. So, um, but just there's sort of this sense, I think, throughout the show where it just feels a little ham fisted and things are a little too obvious. Things are a little too, they're not particularly subtle about a lot of stuff. It feels dragged out much longer than it needs to be. Uh, I don't think it needed to be like one episode per death per kid i get why they did it that way but honestly they probably could have made this a two-hour movie you know and it would have worked just fine because again these characters are super one-dimensional and you could have kind of i don't know maybe it wouldn't have worked as a two-hour movie maybe there's just too much in there but you could have had three kids and just shown all how three of them die you didn't really need six kids that was just to pad out six episodes and some of them are much, much more interesting than others. Like, for instance, the last, the eldest child dies last. The eldest boy, uh, and he's <laughs> he's actually played by the kid, the guy who plays Elliot in ET, uh, whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head. But he is really despicable by the end, and that worked really. I mean, that was creepy. And honestly, if they'd had a little more focus on that and less on. Some of these other more superfluous siblings, I swear to God, like three or four of the siblings, it just doesn't matter. They're super forgettable. Their deaths are odd and like, it just, it feels like padding. So overall though, I mean, even though I'm complaining about these things, even though I don't think it was the best show in the world, I mean, I did watch it in a few days. Uh, I was entertained. I'm, I'm not pissed off that I spent my time watching that show it's it's far from the best show of the year it's not something i'll ever re-watch uh but i you know sometimes you just need kind of dumb you know entertaining drama i liked the references to edgar Allan poe it was fun to think about those and like it was fun when you like were, when you notice one and you're like oh that's right or like you know afterwards you start reading about it and you're like oh okay that's these are there's even there's a bunch of stuff I did miss right like some of the character names have to do with real people in in Poe's life and so on and so forth so that's all fun um, I liked Midnight Mass better but uh, but again I don't know that that's a show I would necessarily re I might rewatch Mid Midnight Mass actually that had some pretty cool stuff uh, more interesting 
characters and a little bit of a deeper dive into some of those characters, I feel like, whereas this just felt like sort of like check off kid number one. Now we're going to go to kid number two and now, you know, I don't know. What did you think? Let me know what you thought down in the comments. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe, hit the notification bell and, uh, you know, let me know your thoughts. But uh, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Peace.